I was only nine when the Nintendo Entertainment System launched here in the U.S., and I'd never wanted anything so badly in my life. Plenty of my friends had one, but I was never so lucky. With games, the likes of which had never been seen before outside the arcade, the console is etched upon my memory as the greatest of all time. But was it really the best? I think it's time we pulled back the curtain and found out. While perhaps not as important as the technical specs, styling is still part of the equation when it comes to choosing the best console. So how did the NES stack up? Well, ask anyone over 30 what this is, and dollars to donuts, they'll know right away. Nintendo didn't want the system to look like a cheap toy or even a video game machine at all, so they modeled it to resemble a VCR. The resulting design was certainly unique, but also problematic. Loading cartridges was an engaging and tactile ritual, but the use of a zero insertion force connector led to all kinds of issues, both electrical and mechanical. One trick known by every kid and passed around on the playground would actually make the problem worse. Even so, the design remains iconic to this day, so they get an A for effort. Nintendo later released a cost-reduced model and did away with all the unnecessary complication. They also got rid of any trace of style. What was it about not wanting to look like a cheap toy? Adding insult to injury, the updated model ditched the original's composite video output, leaving RF as the only option in 1993. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The best console has to have high specs, right? By the time of the 1986 nationwide US launch, the underlying technology was already starting to get a little long in the tooth. After all, the Japanese Famicom from which it derived was already a full three years old by this point. The system design allowed for cartridges with up to 40 kilobytes, 32 for code and 8K for graphics. The first Super Mario Bros. game already maxed out these limits on day one. Keep in mind that the Famicom was designed with 1981's Donkey Kong Arcade as its target. Later, more advanced titles required enhancement chips in the cartridges to extend the system's capabilities. Wasn't it Bill Gates that said 40k ought to be enough for anybody? Something like that. The best console has to have a capable processor and the Ricoh-produced 6502 in the NES was in good company with contemporaries like Acorn, Apple, Atari, and Commodore. Only thing was, Nintendo blatantly ripped off MOS Technology's design. Sure, they disabled the binary-coded decimal circuitry, but that was just to tiptoe around patent infringement and having to pay licensing fees. Things sure were wild back in those days. Graphics, probably the most important aspect of a game console. Fortunately, the Nintendo had them. Colors, too. 54 if you count the eight shades of black, white, and gray. Screens are constructed from 8x8 eight eight pixel tiles and sprites, each being allowed three colors with a shared background. The results were impressive when compared to home computers of the day. But what about the competition? Sega's Master System had a similar sized color palette, but could make use of it far more effectively with each 8x8 eight eight tile allowing 16 colors. Last I checked, 16 was a lot more than three. Regardless, tile-based graphics are great. They're fast and efficient for the types of 2D and pixel art games that the third generation consoles were famous for. On the flip side, the Nintendo had no provisions for bitmap or 3D graphics, so certain types of games were difficult to port to the platform. Not impossible though, as Elite here demonstrates. With clever programming and extra RAM in the cartridge, the CPU can be used to render new tiles into memory on the fly. We've now seen both hardware and software hacks to expand the system well beyond its original capabilities. The best consoles are extensible. The Picture Processing Unit, or PPU, renders video at 60 frames per second. This is a good thing. 60 FPS gaming is responsive and lag-free. That, of course, assumes the developer knew what they were doing. Here's the thing. The PPU is going to spit out a frame of video whether the CPU is done with the next one or not. Bad at optimizing your code? No problem, just repeat the previous frame and have your game run at 30 FPS instead. In extreme cases, even lower. I mean, who's gonna notice? They're just kids. Some devs were like, you know what? Let's just go ahead and draw the screen whether the game logic is finished or not. What could possibly go wrong? Hey, at least it's technically running at 60 FPS. 
sound. The NES had that too. Five glorious channels, no less. Unlike the Commodore 64's three programmable SID channels, the Nintendo had fixed waveforms. Two pulse, one triangle, one white noise, and one for digital samples. Because the same waveforms had to be used, a lot of the games tended to sound pretty similar. Still not convinced? Nevertheless, the music and sound from many games went on to become absolutely iconic. I bet you can hum the tune to at least a couple without even having to think about it. We all know that Nintendo single-handedly saved the games industry after the worldwide video game collapse of 1983. Of course, in doing so, they decimated the market for the Commodore 64, yet another slap in the face after stealing their CPU design. It is hard to argue the fact that the NES had a great library of games, over four times that of the Master System. This was no coincidence, as the company aggressively pursued exclusivity agreements with publishers to the detriment of their competition. Claims of saving the industry may have been greatly exaggerated. They also implemented a lockout chip and required publishers to pay in advance for cartridge production, shifting all of the risk while realizing profit even while developers were losing money. Nintendo's business practices even resulted in Congress and the Federal Trade Commission starting an antitrust investigation. After all that, many publishers were wary when it came to the company's subsequent consoles, which is one reason Nintendo has relied heavily on first-party titles ever since. Finally, the best console needs to have great accessories. While the original controllers did end up causing millions of cramped hands and blistered thumbs, the now iconic Game & Watch inspired D-pad can be said to have informed the design of all console game pads that would follow. Of course, there were plenty of third-party controllers and accessories as well. In Japan, they got all the cool stuff like the disc system, modem, 3D glasses, and even a keyboard. Here in America, we got this instead. And this. Great. Okay, so no console is perfect. Regardless of its shortcomings, the Nintendo Entertainment System will be remembered as one of the greats. But was it the best? Well, if we overlook the shady business practices and technical limitations, it did outsell Sega 3 to 1 worldwide, but not in every market. At the end of the day, the best console is most likely the one you have the fondest childhood memories of. So for me, that's the Commodore 64. I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Metro Bits. <laughs>